right, how's everyone doing? Everyone get their muffins? You get your coffee? You awake? How many coffees? All right, I am going to get us started today with a very quick story. It's 2008, and I had my very first job. I was an intern at Ruder Finn. Ruder Finn's this really, really big PR firm, big building in New York City. Everyone wore suits and ties, but I was part of this very unique, small division in a very dark corner of that building called the Interactive Division. And we got to do really creative, exciting things. We got to do blogger outreach. That was really exciting and innovative at that time. Uh, we got to develop websites. We were working on websites like the Metropolitan Museum and things like that. And we'd always look to new technologies to see where we can bring our clients. And one day my boss, he's this little, uh, very smart, kind of crazy German guy named Jan. And he calls me into his office. He says, David, uh, what is this Twitter thing? I'm like, I don't know. What, what are you talking about? He's like, I heard about Twitter, and uh, it, everyone's talking about it. So he tells me to go find out what Twitter is. So I go back to my office, and I look up what Twitter is, and I come back, and I say, Jan, I have no idea. Uh, something about 140 characters. It looks pretty stupid, to be honest. And uh, he said, well, did you, did you post something to it? Like, did you use it? I said, no, I didn't. I just kind of looked around. He said, OK, go post something. Come back, and I want to see what you post so I can see what it looks like. So I swear, this is my first tweet in 2008. <laughs> and now, 40,000 tweets later, it's a little embarrassing. Yes, I've tweeted over 40,000 times since 2008. Seven years later, I didn't know that, that that day, that moment, would kind of set the, the path for my career, for this industry, and, and everything that I knew about business would change. There were a couple other people, though, who did have better predictions. 2008 was also when Seth Godin released his really popular book, Tribes. In it, he argued and predicted that companies, their relationships with customers would change. It would be less about marketing to people and more about building a tribe of your community, building your customers into this community where they're interconnected. And he, he, he said that, le that co companies need to be leaders. They need to be organizers. They need to start rethinking their interaction with customers. Two years later, Lisa Gansky released a book called The Mesh, which really predicted what we now know today as the collaborative consumption or the sharing economy space. And, and basically showed that these companies would become more collaborative, that they would become more interactive, that they would become communities. And I really think that both of them were actually very accurate in a lot of the predictions, uh, but it just took a while to get to that point, right? And I think we're finally finding us ourselves at this point today. I think we're in a very, very exciting time right now. There's a reason that all of us are here in this room. There's a reason that we're all doing what we're doing for a living. And it's because companies are returning to become community driven. I'm going to explain what that means. And throughout this talk, I want to get us started today by giving you all a, a clear narrative. I think one of the challenges we all face is explaining why what we do is important, why it's valuable, why it's relevant today. And so I think having a more clear narrative will help you do a better job and will help you better communicate what you do to other people, to your boss, to your team. And so that, that's what I want to get us started with today, and I think it will properly set the tone for all the amazing speakers we have for you today. So to really understand what I mean by the return to community-driven business, we're going to start all the way at the beginning of companies. The actual word company comes from two Latin words, cum, which means together, and panis, which means bread. The original company was people coming together, eating together, drinking together, and exchanging goods and services. That's what a company was. It looked like this. They were merchants, they were traders, they were people. They were all interconnected. They were one collaborative ecosystem. There was no central company creating value for everybody. It was everybody contributing in some way so that they can survive and have the things that they need. But they're also very isolated. 
There were lots of other companies all around, but they couldn't really communicate with anyone outside of their immediate surroundings, right? You can only communicate and exchange goods and services with the people who are around you. And so during that time, companies were collaborative. They were highly collaborative as a group of people collaborating, but they were isolated. They weren't connected. They couldn't really communicate. And so it was limited in how much you can really collaborate. Then we had the Industrial Revolution. And over several hundred years, companies became centralized. It changed from a group of people collaborating to create value for each other and became a company creating all the value for the market. They focused every single thing that a person has to do for a living became a very, very specific task amongst this assembly line. And they optimized for mass production, right? And so during that time, we became much more efficient at creating products and creating value, but the company and the customer, the company and the community became two separate entities. So we went from this, where it was entirely collaborative and isolated, to something that looks more like this. The company and the market are separate. They split up. There's a company creating the value, they ship out the product to the community, they market to the community, but that community still remains isolated, right? Those green circles are, are not connected to each other. They couldn't communicate. If they liked a the product or they didn't like a product or whatever they thought about the community, uh, about the company, they couldn't really communicate that with each other. And so during that time, companies became highly centralized and people were highly uh, disconnected still, right? They still couldn't really communicate. Communication was getting better. We had the telegraph and we started to inventing new uh, communication channels, but we weren't all connected. We couldn't access that kind of information at any time. That brings us to today. Well, recently. Uh, today, now we have the digital revolution, or as a lot of people call it, the information age. And during the information age, we all of a sudden had access to everything we needed to know. Everything about a business, everything that was good about their product, everything that was bad. We can access that information. And as a result, companies had to start caring. They had to start thinking about what customers had to say again because we had access to that information. If we didn't like a product, they would share it and other people can see that. They can see their reputation online. And so we start to see this shift towards customer-centric companies again. Right, Zappos really led the way. They weren't a shoe company. They were a customer service company that happened to sell shoes. Right? That's what they would describe themselves as. And more and more companies started to become customer centric. Right? They started to focus on customer service, focus on what customers are saying about their company. And then the next phase of the digital revolution, I think you'll all remember this one, we all became social media specialists. And social media became this huge thing, right? We're getting back now to 2008, 2007. Facebook's really growing. Twitter's starting to come out. Social media is exploding. And all of a sudden, we didn't just have access to information. We had access to each other. We could connect with anybody anywhere in the world. So not only could we see information that was there already, we could communicate and ask in real time what people think about companies, what they think about products. And of course, what did the social media specialists tell companies they need to do is develop relationships. It's not just about responding to customers, it's about also proactively developing relationships, reaching out with them, being real, being human, being connected to them through social media. And during that time, companies took another big step toward being customer-centric. And so we went from this during the Industrial Revolution, where the company and the market and the community are completely separated, to something like this. All of a sudden, the market was highly, highly connected in a way that we've never seen before, and the relationship shifted to just blasting messages out to having a two-way conversation. So during that time, companies remained centralized, right? It was still the company creating the value and then the market consuming that value, but people became highly, highly connected. And that's what started to create this shift that brings us to today. Today, I think we're seeing the ultimate return to community. And we see evidence everywhere. All these trends that are really popular now, we hear it around Silicon Valley, 
It all adds up into this return to community, collaborative consumption, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, user groups, ambassador programs. These are all community-centric programs. All of these add up into why we're here, why there's 400 community professionals who could come together for an event like never before. There's a reason that we're seeing more jobs, more community programs being launched, more companies starting to talk about community. It's because everything is moving back towards this community-centric kind of model. It's a whole new form of business. And the fundamental difference between a traditional company and a community-driven company is a traditional company creates all the value and they ship that out to the market. They ship it out to the community. A community-driven company doesn't just create value, they create an environment for people to collaborate and create value for each other. Right? It's a very simple but clear difference. They don't create all the value, they create a space for people to create value for each other. And so, we went from this during the social media age to this. For the, for, the, oops. for the first time since the beginning of companies, the community and the company became one again. It became one entity. It's no longer the company and then the community, the company and then the market. It's one cohesive system. And if you rethink how companies function in this way, it changes everything. And as a result, it creates this collaborative space. And so we see every company now has some form of collaborator, or they're moving toward that direction, right? The collaborators are the drivers on Lyft. They're the hosts on Airbnb. They're the editors on Wikipedia. They're the people who are in that space that you've created, that the company has created, who are collaborating to create value for each other. That's what the return to community-driven business is. And so for the first time since the beginning of companies, they are once again collaborative. But this time, we're highly, highly, highly connected. So if you think about it, the collaborative system before could only work so much because we're limited by our local vicinity, by who's around us. But now that we're highly connected on this extreme level, the opportunity for creating value through collaboration is limitless. We don't even truly understand the extent to which this kind of value can be created and to how fast companies can scale, how they can build products, how they can integrate this program. We don't even know yet because it's still so new. This is the first time that this is happening since the beginning of companies. The evidence is all around us, right? We have Airbnb, right, created a space for people to exchange value, to exchange their homes, instead of just buying up a lot of real estate and, and selling it. There are now 17 companies in the collaborative consumption space that are valued at over a billion dollars. This is a brand new business format that is growing exponentially. We're finally at this point now where it's validated as a business model, and that's why we're all here. That's why we're at this return to community-driven business. Product hunt. Instead of if you look at traditional media sites, you hire a bunch of reporters and you create uh, all this editorial content to launch every new startup. You choose which startups to launch. Instead, they said, let's create a space where people can collaborate to share news about new products and, and, new, and new launches. And now they're one of the fastest growing companies, on, uh, fastest growing websites on the internet. Envato, a community for designers that's been around for a long time actually, has now paid over a quarter of a billion dollars out to their community because they created an environment for designers to collaborate and, 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 and they developed a number of markets that are all community-centric. But it doesn't have to be your product. Even if your product isn't a community, you can create a space for your community to contribute to the product or contribute to your business in different ways. I love the Duolingo example. Duolingo now has over 100 million users. They're one of the largest online language learning platforms in the world. They started out building all their own classes. They started out hiring language experts, paying a lot of money to develop each course, and then they opened it up to their community. And now their community translates, edits, curates, and develops all of their courses, and they have over 70 different language courses now. So instead of creating all the value, they created a space where people their language experts all over the world to collaborate to create those courses, to create that value. 
Salesforce, right? They have an MVP program where now they bring together their customers, uh, their most valuable customers, to contribute to where their product is going, to contribute product feedback. They have actually integrated community into their product. It's completely tight-knit. They also host a little event called Dreamforce. I don't know if you guys <laughs> noticed, it was a small event in San Francisco recently. Right? Like tens of thousands of people, all their customers coming together to exchange knowledge and advice. Right? So Salesforce is one of the largest SaaS companies in the world, highly reliant on community, even though their product is in a community. Big brands. Sephora actually has a community for people to exchange beauty advice and makeup advice. It may not even have to do with their product, but it's a place for people to express their interests and come together. Massive community platform. Of course, we've seen uh, support sites for a very long time, and those are growing as well. Lots of sites are now creating a space for their community to support each other, to ask questions. On Sony, you can ask about any digital device. Anyone who has a question, a challenge, any problem, they can ask, and there's a community of people there who can create that value for each other. Right? And we see lots of companies developing support systems, not just for support like this, but also for customer success. Right? I helped Udemy build their community program a while back, Every, and Udemy being a, an online education platform, one of their biggest challenges was students, I mean, uh, teachers would join the platform and not know how to launch their course. They'd have to develop videos, it's a whole long process, figuring out how to optimize your product, your, your, your training course. And so they, instead of trying to just create all the content and try to manually onboard every single teacher, they created a community where their teacher would join this community of other teachers. And that's where they can ask any question, they can get advice, they even get mentors so that other teachers help each other get onto the platform. Right? So you can create support mentor programs that allow your users to join and be helped by a person rather than by the company. And finally, we have Lululemon, right? This is an example of a marketing-focused community program. They have global ambassadors all over the world. They host a massive festival. Their ambassadors are the representatives of their brand on the ground all over the world, right? So ambassador grow programs are growing really quickly right now. We see more and more brands, startups, tech companies, everybody's launching ambassador programs, evangelist programs, creating word of mouth. It's basically community is the new marketing. Why is this happening now, though? We've had some of this technology for a while. We've always been human. We've always enjoyed collaborating. We've always wanted to be a part of a community. Why is it happening now? I think there's three main reasons. One, we are highly, highly connected. Right? We're glued to our phones. I actually do this like all the time with my roommates. Um, <laughs> We were connected before, technology made information available, and in social media made that connection available, but this access to it at any time from our pockets is what allowed us to bring it into the real world. Technology is allowing us to collaborate physically as well as online now. So where you know, the Wikipedias and Mozilla's and things like that have been around for a while because we're able to collaborate online, now thanks to mobile smartphone technology, we're able to collaborate in real time at any time. Two is, it took a while to gain trust, right? Like, I don't know if you guys remember, it wasn't that long ago uh, when Airbnb and Lyft and all these platforms were starting to grow, people were like really hesitant, like, I don't know, don't wanna stay in someone's home. And now a lot of people can't even imagine a different way. We, it took a while to develop trust in these collaborative systems, to once again trust each other and not just the brands. The brand's job is to create an environment for people to collaborate, and that meant creating an environment that's trusting and trustworthy. And it took them a while to get to that point, but I think now we're finally at that point where it's not really a question anymore, right? People aren't really concerned in the way they used to be about trusting a collaborative system. And finally, our expectations are changing for how businesses work. Millennials are growing in the workforce, are growing in the customer base, and the general mentality around what businesses need to be is changing. Companies now have to be mission-driven. They have to be environmentally conscious. We're no longer looking to just buy a product. We're looking to be part of that mission. We're looking for a company that represents something that we also believe in. So as that's changing, companies have to adapt to be able to meet those needs, to meet those expectations. Why does this matter for us? Why does this matter for community professionals? Well, as companies have to create these environments for people to collaborate, 
who do you think's job it is to create that environment? It's ours. It's our job. This is our responsibility. The reason we're seeing more community professionals hired than ever before, we're seeing the conversation grow, we're seeing more companies invest in community, the reason our industry is finally reaching a point where it's becoming more mature, where it's becoming established, we're figuring out these strategies, is because it's a core part of businesses now. But a lot of people don't have this experience. They don't know how to bring people together. They don't know how to organize true communities. They know how to market a message out, but they don't know how to build communities. So this is highly relevant for every single community professional. This is why all of a sudden our industry is in the spotlight. But it's not just our responsibility to execute and build that community. As I pointed out, this is a massive change. And we're just right now getting to the point where it's culminating, where it's maturing. But it's a change. And so our role as community professionals isn't just going to be to build communities. We're change managers. We have to shepherd our companies into this community-driven business time. It's our job to help the rest of the company understand what it means to be a community-driven business. What does it actually look like from the inside out to invest into community? Not just as a tactic, but as a core business philosophy. You are the CEO of your community. How many of you have thought of yourselves that way, ever? All right, we got some bold people, good. You are the CEO of your community. What does that mean? It's up to you to set a vision. It's up to you to be strong about what it means to be building community for your company. You are building community as a CEO of that community within your own organization. You have to be the representative of the community, of this entire movement. Start thinking of yourselves not as somebody who's just responsible for building community, think of yourself as a CEO who's building an entirely new organization from the inside out. I'm gonna set the rest of the day off with basically the five fundamentals that I think are extremely important for any community-driven business, right? It's, to me, they're non-negotiables. You can't build a community-driven business without these fundamentals. One, you have to take a stance. You have to. Nobody ever formed a community around uh, uh, an idea that wasn't based on a true belief. They're not coming to you because of your product. They're not going to feel a sense of identity and a sense of belonging because of what you're building. They're going to be a part of it because you've taken a stance. People join communities of people that believe as they believe. Take a stance. Be strong. Say something. Piss people off. If you're not pissing anyone off, you're probably not doing it right, right? If you're trying to please everybody, you're going to please nobody, nobody's going to want to be a part of your community. Communities are defined by their boundaries. They're defined by we belong because we believe this way, and there are people out there who don't believe the same way we do. That's what forms communities. Every single community has that boundary. Two, look within. You cannot in any way expect to build a healthy community of your customers, of your ambassadors, of anybody outside of your employee base if you don't have a healthy community at your core. Think about how companies start. A founder has an idea, they have a vision, and they organize people around that vision. They start hiring people, they start building a team. That team has a common interest, they have a common goal, they have an ongoing shared experience, that's what a community is. Your team is a community. It may not be a healthy one, but it is a community. And unless you focus on that community first and make sure that's healthy, there is no way you can expect your customer communities or anything outside of that to also be healthy. And if you do it right, if you build a strong, healthy, core community, that will bleed into everything the company does. Design, product, development, marketing, Everything will be built on this foundation of a core community, of a group of people who believe the same thing together, who are motivated, who are collaborating, who are working together for this mission. Look within and start with your core. Three. Oh, forgot that picture. Don't convince, organize the convinced. If you're building a community and you're trying to convince people to change their beliefs, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> You're in for a long, long road. What you want to do when you build a community, when you're building a community-driven business, is to find the people who already believe as you believe. They're out there. Organize them. It might just be 10 people. It might just be five people. But find those people and bring them together. Because they don't need convincing. They already believe what you believe, but they've been isolated. They haven't been brought together. And so your opportunity, the greatest opportunity to build any community is when you find a group of people with a shared belief who are isolated, who aren't connected, and you create a space for them to come together and integrate. And only after you have that, when you have the core group of people who are highly integrated and highly collaborative, and they all believe the same thing, then other people are gonna wanna join. Because once they see the group form, they want to join in on that group, right? They want to be a part of the movement. They see that energy and they want to be a part of it. But in the early days, if you don't already have that strong core, you can't convince somebody to start caring about it unless they already care about it. I keep forgetting my pictures. That's more of this. I have something good about like choosing the right path or something. Four. <laughs> oh, man. Get, co uh, get comfortable with giving up control. Community is about distributing control. Companies aren't very good at that traditionally. We like to control everything. Our brand, our message, our language, what, what employees say, which employees are allowed to say anything. Um, as companies grow, they become more and more controlling. That's not how com communities work. Communities are about distributing control. It's about empowering people to take your message, take your vision, take your belief, and run with it, make it their own, right? You need to create the guide rails that they can work within, which are your mission, your vision, your values. Make sure they don't violate those things in the way they represent your brand. But within that, you gotta give them flexibility. You have to give them autonomy. You have to give them power. You have to make them feel special, right? TED doesn't grow TEDx unless they give people some power to truly take their brand and create that experience. They have a like 80 page playbook, that's their guide rail, but there has to be some level of distributing control. If you have organizers, you have ambassadors, if you have collaborators, if you're doing anything where people are collaborating, the only way they're gonna do it is if they actually have control over what they're doing. If they feel like they're just being told exactly what to do, <laughs> and a lot of the time they're not getting paid for it, it's not gonna work for very long. So give people control. <laughs> be comfortable with giving up control. And finally, treat community like a discipline. If there's one thing I want you all to walk away with today, it's this. This is a professional discipline. This is not a fluffy, nebulous strategy anymore. Community is something that professionals do for a living. There are strategies. There are frameworks. There are companies who have made billions of dollars doing this stuff. The people in this room do this for a living. It's time that we, as an industry, start talking about it that way. Communities struggle for a long time because it's always part of something else. You're a community person, but you work on marketing. Oh yeah, I, do, I build community, but I'm working on the product team. I do support. Or God forbid, I manage social media. <laughs> Community is its own discipline. It's not necessarily part of marketing, product, any other part. It's a practice that we are here to learn, that we're here to get better at, that we're here to share our story so other companies can see how to do this on a professional level. Only once we start treating community as a discipline will companies really be able to succeed at building community? Because they can't look at it as just something they also do. It has to be a core part of what they do, and, and that means they have to have a community professional as part of their business. Imagine a marketing-driven business that doesn't have any marketing people in it. Imagine a design-driven business that hires no designers. It doesn't work. If you want to be a community-driven business, you need to hire community professionals, and you need to start treating community like the discipline that it is. You guys agree? Yes. 
<laughs> Speaking to the choir here a little bit, huh? Yeah. Cool. I swear we're really good at what we do. <laughs> really professional. Companies are finally once again collaborative. Companies are connected. Companies are once again communities. Let's do this. <laughs>